So looking at voters' preference and behavior, what are voters, what did they look at when they voted today? Well, I mean, we don't know the final results yet, no, but based on the projections I saw a while ago, uh, I mean, we cannot make generalizations about the voters because we, we see three different strands here. The two usual ones are the reformists and the populists, B9 being the more populist, just like Arab. And the reformist one, essentially, if you look at the platform of Poe and Marajas, there's at least 90% overlap there. So it's just a question of differences in terms of party and personality. And then you have a third strand, and this is what I call the strongman strand. And I think both Bongo, Marcos, and Duterte kind of fit into that. Although, of course, their delivery is different. Marcos is a little bit more polished, while more spontaneous on the part of Duterte. So you see that voters actually are split along these three different lines. Last survey suggests that Duterte is getting at least 30%, so that's not majority. He may get more than that tonight based on the trend that we're seeing in the projections. But that doesn't mean that all voters essentially identify with him. But Richard I think he, he's... His strategy of presenting himself as an authentic, independent candidate, outside the box candidate, has clearly resonated at least with a significant number of the voters. And you could say that it's, this is also a protest vote against the whole system that replaced Marcus' dictatorship since 1986. Yeah, but that's what I wanted to ask. Now, Richard, why is there such a strong clamor for a strong man yeah. or an independent voice, right. considering that our economy has grown mm. quite pretty well right. for the past few right. years. A lot of people have been, a lot of uh, foreign mm. investors are very happy what's happened to the Philippines. Why suddenly right. there's a, like, a yeah. clamor for this big change? This is the question that all international investors and media have been asking me for the past two weeks. Uh, as I've written extensively on this issue, first of all, what's happening in the Philippines, this strongman phenomenon is nothing unique. Uh, in 2014, Narendra Modi, a Hindu nationalist, a very controversial former chief of Gujarat province, won the prime ministership. He essentially promised the same kind of single-willed strongman leadership. In Peru today, Keiko Fujimori, the daughter of former dictator, is still right now in jail. She's supposed to be the next president. And of course, even in established democracy, you have Donald Trump, now the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. So all around the world, you see the strongman candidates coming forward, not to mention Erdogan in Turkey, Putin in, in the case of Russia. So you see a lot of disillusionment with the existing system, particularly with emerging market democracies. Because what happened, happened in the last six years in the Philippines uh, is, was best captured by political scientist Samuel Huntington in his book 1968, Political Order in Changing Societies. His argument is that the societies that are most vulnerable to autocratic takeover or political breakdown or political decay are societies that grow very fast which leads to an explosion in expectation and the gap between reality, gradual change with disappointments and explosion of ex expectation is what creates this whole room of frustration that is open to exploitation by certain uh, candidates. So now, Willie and Ross, so do you think that Rodrigo Duterte, you know, <coughs> being leading the one in the polls and in the past few years, was able to take advantage of what Richard said was our present um, economy or present situation right now? Or was it a marketing strategy, really? Really? Um, thank you, Rod. Thank you, Gene, for the question. Well, I think uh, just, to, just to add to what Richard has said, um, it's true that uh, the economy has seen consistent growth for the past six years uh, under the Aquino administration, which was basically a, continu a, con a, a continuity of uh, the Dang Matuid platform of uh, Mar Rojas, um, and that the foreign investors um, were singing praises about our economic achievements. However, as we all know, um, the biggest opportunity also was that the growth was not trickling down. All right, So that the inclusive growth was the, really the main issue and the widening in inequality in uh, income distribution was, was a, a real uh, pain for, for the economy. Um, that was also, um, I think, uh, uh, seen in the numbers for poverty uh, having been unchanged over the past six years, as well as uh, hunger uh, incidence has also gone up. So <clears throat> if you put those numbers together, it's really not, I would think, I would, I would think that it's not uh, contradictory, uh, but in fact, it really just shows that the truth is more important than the facts. While the facts show economic growth, the truth is it's really not translating to the vast majority of uh, our 90% of our population, as you know, our CDE, and that's who your voters are. So in Duterte, I believe that they saw somebody who finally can represent the inclusive growth and the safety and security that they're looking for 
beyond the, the promises of other candidates. But what's interesting here is that actually, for example, crime, um, the crime issue was not a main issue of the voters prior to Rodrigo yeah. Duterte yeah. actually expressing his yeah. interest yeah. to run or expressing yeah. his, that he will run for president. But he was somehow able to market it as an electoral issue. You know, I, I, I personally think his uh, rise to popularity, while the, his, his stance on criminality is important, and, and, and also his, his uh, macho stance, yeah. but I'm, I'm gonna get all of them. I think ultimately, uh, we're, we're living in a world that's a little bit cynical. Uh, we're living in a world where polit political correctness is now the rule rather yeah. than the exception. And I think people just are th just tired of the rhetoric. They're just tired of the, the cookie cutter statements. I'm gonna improve the economy, I'm gonna create jobs. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, what's happening now is that you're seeing uh, a guy who, uh, to some extent, has changed the rules of, of marketing. Because in marketing, you hype up what's good about your product and you downplay the negative things about your product. But he said, look, this is what I am. I'm a, I'm a womanizer. I kill people. Uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a disciplinarian. So you think, bro, this is really just who being he is. This I'm isn't a marketing strategy yeah, as well. It's, and, well, in a way, it's also like, it's good marketing strategy because it's, it, it's different. So it's kind of non-conformist, it's direct, it's authentic, and, and it's, uh, it's consistent. He's always been like that. I'm going to change the, the, the system to federalism. I'm going to go for parliamentary. I'm going to change the constitution. And he never wavered. He never changed. So to some extent, um, while he changed the rules, uh, to some extent, because you know, the rules before was you have to be polished. You don't, don't put up your negative things, uh, your no negative aspects. Only hype up the good things about you. He changed that. And I, I think what people are looking for now is just authenticity. And they saw someone that I can relate to this guy because, uh, to some extent, he's like he's like Jaworski in a way. He has this Jaworski phenomenon that, parang, it, even if Jaworski was playing dirty or something, yeah, I was gonna he, say that it it's as if the rules yeah. didn't apply to him. For example, apply. with Bina, if corruption issues came, yeah. they would stick to him. They would stick to him like glue. But with Duterte, even with Chelianis, you know, um, pounding him with all these allegations of hidden wealth, it didn't seem to stick. It, it probably even helped him to some extent. Because uh, I, I think, uh, again, and also, who, who was delivering the message about the corruption? It was, it was Trillanes who, uh, unfortunately... It was also the messenger at The that messenger, point. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, mistrust by uh, Senator Trillanes because of what he did before. And of course, there, he's a senator. A lot of people, uh, I mean, have voted him in. But I think that's also one of the crucial things. Who was the messenger? If it was someone else, perhaps may have been different. For this particular issue, do you think that it was still traditional media that had a big impact or was it also social media? Yeah, well, the thing is this. Uh, in 2013, there was a social media backlash against the uh, bid of Nancy Binay for Senate. And she won very well. And I think there was an impression, oh, social media is overrated. These netizens are never going to vote. This is not going to echo. What matters is the traditional media and ground warfare. But what I think happened in this election is that certain candidates like Mary Duterte, like Bongbong bon Marcos, had this very systematic strategy of creating this narrative that what we need right now is a strong man. What we need, not, not, need right now is political will. So if you look at Duterte, he always says, anyone can download whatever platform from wherever. I can even get your platform. The difference between I and you is that I have the political will, you don't have that. And the other thing with him is that he preempts his opponents. He doesn't, he doesn't give him a chance to go after him. He already says, yeah, I am what I am, right? You, so he preempts them and he takes away from them that opportunity to actually sabotage him down the road. While all other candidates, when they're under attack, they try to be defensive. I mean, even in, I, I think the, pro, the biggest problem was not only with Binay on the case of corruption, but was also with Marojas. Marojas barely apologized for the shortcomings of this administration. It's not only lack of inclusive growth. It's the fact that we have the worst traffic in the world, according to certain survey, infrastructure development has been very slow. So it looks like like that they really changed the rules, and what we want to know next would be why that worked.